Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Yeah. I'm Ashwin Ram. I'm a senior manager on the Alexa AI science team as part of Alexa Machine Learning. I also have with me uh, Spiros Matsukas, uh, one of our scientists. I'll introduce him in a little more detail. We're going to speak with you today about the science that was developed for the Alexa Prize. The Alexa Prize, I think many of you are aware, was a competition we ran all year for university students to develop conversational skills for Alexa that could speak with customers engagingly and coherently for 20 minutes about popular topics and current events, things in the news, sports, politics, et cetera. I'll tell you a little more, a bit more about that. And in doing so, uh, you know, in, in doing this, we had to advance the state of conversational AI. Many of the advances that were made also apply to other kinds of conversational interactions, and so we are excited to share those advances with you. Before I talk about the Alexa Prize, uh, let's set the context by talking about conversation. So you imagine a customer speaking with Alexa or an Alexa-enabled device and having a conversation. So a conversation between people or between a person and a machine involves so multiple steps of interactions around a set of topics. So in this example, for example, uh, we have a, um, uh, a user saying, is it hot outside? Alexa responds with, it's sunny and warm. How about this weekend? You now have to know how about refers to what's the weather like this weekend as opposed to something else. Uh, clouds are rolling in, it'll be overcast. Will I need an umbrella? Okay, yeah, what's the right answer? Now, you don't really know unless you know the location. Alexa might ask you. Depends on where you'll be. Um, I was thinking of hiking the dish. Okay, so in that case, et cetera. So imagine a multi-turn natural conversation around weather or music or ordering something online. Uh, whatever your application may be, where the user and, the, and Alexa can sort of have a natural conversation to unpack and with very little uh, friction get to what the right answer might be for the user instead of sort of guessing and getting it wrong or giving them menus of choices. So that's sort of the, the aim. When we started the Alexa Prize, uh, like with many programs here at Amazon, we start with what we call the North Star. This is so what success would look like if you can engage in a conversation like this. So if you're conversing about everyday social topics, uh, a user might uh, come in and say, Alexa, let's chat about the Mars mission. So in this example, I'll let you read it. Uh, there are multiple Mars missions, some pri public, some private. Who do you think will succeed? This is hard because now you're asking Alexa for an opinion about a future event that hasn't occurred yet. There's no right answer here, but Alexa does have to respond. I think more than one will succeed, et cetera. Uh, the user now says, I'd love to go to Mars. Now the user is expressing an opinion or a preference. You have to be able to incorporate that into the dialogue. In this case, we respond with humor. Another hard problem. Right? So we don't want to dis detract from the, the topic of the conversation. It's still about going to Mars, still about space, but the humor is sort of woven in seamlessly. Um, Alexa then, now that's very funny, Alexa now changes the topic a little bit. It's, you know, the biggest challenge is, is, is funding. And now we are switching into politi uh, political conversation, even though it's still about technology and it's still on topic. So how do we maintain topic across these terms? Uh, you can imagine this for other kinds of contexts as well. Uh, if you're interacting with Alexa about, say, trying to find a movie to watch or planning a, a night out on the weekend, you may be switching topics a little bit. Where should I go? What's the weather going to be like? I need a taxi. Can you get me a restaurant reservation? And you're sort of seamlessly moving around different intents and different entities, but weaving that together into a natural experience. So that's the kind of capability we want to create. It's very hard. And it's hard for a number of reasons. Speech recognition gets considerably harder. We now have free form conversational speech. We have users sort of speaking in longer sentences, no clear reference to previous, uh, previous references. You have to sort of guess at them. Uh, people pause more. They restart what they're saying, the um and er and other things, still have to get that right. There's language understanding. How do we understand what utterances mean, particularly when someone says, I'd love to go to Mars, for example. It's not an intent necessarily. We still have to get the meaning of that. Context modeling, um, this is a hard problem. Uh, this morning, Rohit Prasad, the, our uh, chief scientist, uh, announced uh, some of the context capabilities that we're making available to developers, uh, being able to track 
what we are speaking about, the intents and the entities in the conversation across multiple terms of our dialogue and, and carrying that context forward uh, seamlessly. Dialogue planning is about sort of picking the best response. This gets particularly hard again when you have natural conversations and there is not a right answer. If there's a right answer, if there's a question, we can give you an answer. If there's not a question, what do we say? What's the right thing to say? Language generation, what's the best phrasing for this? If you want to tell the joke about hitching a ride, there's sort of a way in which it sounds funny and then there's sort of flat, more flat ways of saying that. How do we adapt to, uh, to different users? Uh, another key problem in speaking about the daily news is knowledge ingestion. If a social bot, is what we call these skills, is able to talk about what's in the news this morning, it has to have read the news and ingested it and incorporated it into its models. And this has to happen fairly dynamically, pretty much in real time or near real time, to keep up with the current events. And that's another hard problem. Uh, common sense reasoning, making inferences about these things, et cetera. So there are a lot of hard challenges in conversation. There are also customer experience challenges. And these are some of them. I won't go through all of these here, but uh, for example, how do we uh, break the ice? How do we start a conversation? Um, you know, in the case of Alexa Prize, you start by saying, Alexa, let's chat. And Alexa now has to start chatting with you. About what? Do we ask you your name first? Do we ask you what you're interested in? Do we guess that from what we know about you already? And so forth. How do we deal with pauses? How do we suggest topics? Uh, do we want to sort of scattershot a lot of different topics? Or do we want to go really deep into a single topic? What's more interesting, what's more engaging for a customer? How do we lead the conversation on when the customer is not quite sure what to say next? How do we handle personal questions? We don't want necessarily these conversational skills to get too much private data out of users, but users will talk about personal stuff. Uh, expressing opinions and sort of uh, weighing that against controversy. We don't want to be controversial. We don't want to be inflammatory, but we do want to have opinions. For example, opinions that Alexa uh, had in the Mars mission example. What do we do about frustration, non-answer? There's a ton of things that go uh, into sort of designing dialogue flow to maintain customer experience. So to uh, address these challenges, uh, and I, I should add, these challenges are currently unsolved. There is no mechanism, there's no piece of software you can download which does all of this already that you can just incorporate. So we have to invent this. So to address this, we decided we would take Alexa and create a research uh, test bed around Alexa that would enable university students to experiment with different techniques and learn from the interactions that they might get from real users. So we announced the Alexa Prize uh, um, a little over a year ago. It was a two and a half million dollar competition to advance conversational AI. The challenge is to create one of these conversational skills, a social bot, a social chat bot, that can converse engagingly and coherently for 20 minutes, and there's a million dollar grand prize to, for reaching that bar. Um, we had um, uh, over 100 teams up, uh, from different universities apply to participate. We selected 18 of them, and then 15 of them actually uh, developed and went public to the, to the customer base on May 8th of this year. Um, since uh, for the last several weeks, Alexa Less Chat has been a top 10 Alexa skill by usage. The customers are very interested in chatting. Uh, there have been over 40,000 hours of conversation with these social bots over the year, over millions of interactions with customers. Uh, and this provides a huge amount of data to the teams, the universities to learn from, uh, feedback, uh, the customers rate the social bot conversations at the end. And so all of that data and the feedback from customers was used to enhance and improve these social bots until we finally ended up with three finalists and this morning announced the winner of a half a million dollar prize. Uh, that was the first prize. None of, the final, none of these teams, they all did exceed, exceedingly well. Uh, if you chat with them now, it's quite amazing to see how far they've come, but none of them was able to reach the 20 minute grand challenge. And so we're gonna run this challenge again next year. So if any uh, students here or folks who have students at home or uh, professors do encourage them to apply. So what I wanted to do today was share with you and, uh, uh, some of the science advances that were created in these areas, uh, language understanding, dialogue modeling, et cetera, that I mentioned over the course of the year. Uh, the all 15 teams have written technical papers about the work they did. 
which are available on the website, alexaprize.com. So you can actually read the science papers and get some, some, some more details uh, by yourselves if you're interested. But let me introduce uh, Spiros Matsukas. He's a senior principal scientist on the Alexa machine learning team uh, who's been working closely with us and helping advance some of these technologies. Uh, Spiros will tell us more about some of these uh, advances that were made. Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, so before we dive into the details of the Alexa Prize competition, I would like to give you an overview of the spoken language understanding technology in Alexa. So Alexa is a, a spoken language understanding service that lives in the cloud that provides uh, a support for voice-based interactions in a wide range of uh, applications. It is supported by two powerful frameworks. On the right-hand side, we show the Alexa voice service that enables Amazon devices such as Echo or Fire TV, as well as third-party manufacturer devices to connect to Alexa. And on the left-hand side, we show the Alexa Skills Kit that enables third-party developers to extend Alexa's functionality through what we call skills. So customers can use Alexa connected devices to perform a wide range of tasks. They can uh, listen to music, uh, audio books, they can uh, watch movies, they can set timers, alarms, manage to-do lists, uh, shop on Amazon.com, manage the calendar, send messages, uh, place phone calls, get information about the weather, traffic, or news, uh, control smart home connected appliances such as lights, thermostats, switches, and they have access to an expanding set of skills, over 25,000 currently, uh, that provide uh, services such as ordering food or managing finances or playing games. And uh, customers, when they access Alexa through a hands-free device such as Amazon Echo, they can do all of these things in the most natural way by just using their voice from anywhere in the room without having to reach out for a phone or press any buttons. So every spoken language understanding system uh, is comprised uh, of ma uh, you know, four main components. The automatic speech recognition, natural language understanding, a dialogue manager, and a text-to-speech synthesis module. So let's see how each of these components uh, uh, is employed when processing a music request, such as uh, play two steps behind by Dev Leopard. So first, the automatic speech recognition uh, module is used to convert the audio into text. Then, uh, this is processed by the natural language understanding component to extract the user's intent and any salient elements uh, such as, or slots associated with that intent. In this specific example, the intent is playing music, and there are two slots. Uh, first is the artist's name, which is Def Leppard, and the second is the song title, which is two steps behind. Then we reach the dialogue manager, which takes in the text and the uh, labels from the natural language understanding component. As, long as, as, uh, as well as associated context, and is trying to decide what action to perform next. So in this example, it might decide to uh, connect to the music skill and ask it to play the requested song. Or it might decide to engage in clarification dialogue with the user, for example, to clarify the name of the artist. And in both cases, it has to generate a text response or prompt that then goes into the text-to-speech synthesis module to create an audio with Alexa's voice to communicate the result back to the user. Now, the common underlying theme across all of these components is data-driven machine learning. And this consists primarily of two phases. So at the bottom of the slide, we show the first phase, which is the training, where input training data, uh, together with uh, ground truth labels, are fed into a training component to generate statistical models. These statistical models are then used in the second phase, which is the inference or decoding phase uh, that runs at, at runtime, processing new inputs and trying to predict the associated labels. And so in the case of the speech recognition, the input is speech and the output is the sequence of the words, whereas in the case of the natural language understanding, the input is the text and the output is the intents and the slots. So this has several advantages. Uh, first, uh, it relies on probabilistic modeling, which means that uh, it, it's more robust to noise and ambiguity. Also, it is relatively inexpensive to generate ground tooth. Uh, you don't require uh, experts in machine learning to do that. And the uh, third argument is that it's portable to new domains and languages. Uh, so when you want to bootstrap new functionality, let's say in a new language, all you have to do is collect data in that language and also provide the associated ground truth labels 
and you can reuse the same trainer and, and decoder modules. You don't have to re-implement anything. Now, those of you who are familiar with the Alexa Skills Kit probably recognize these two phases of machine learning during the skill development process. When you provide uh, utterance samples, uh, these are effectively used as training data to create NLU models for intent recognition and uh, named entity recognition. And so the more examples you provide, the better these models become. Now, another advantage of data-driven machine learning is that once you have statistical models that you have deployed in production, you can continuously improve them using data that comes in from the field. And so in this slide, we show the uh, maintenance lifecycle for the ASR and NLU components in Alexa. So data comes in. We have a portion of the data that is sampled uh, to generate ground truth, in this case, uh, audio transcriptions and also labels for NLU. And we do that with smart selection techniques such as active learning to maximize the learning value of the data that we, that we annotate. There is also a portion of unlabeled audio that is used as is um, uh, to train the ASR model without any human in the loop. And such semi-supervised techniques can also be applied to natural language understanding. Then the resulting models undergo uh, multiple testing uh, to be able to assess the impact of the model training in terms of accuracy and latency. And once they pass this test, they get uh, deployed to production, and then they start a new round of uh, continuous improvement. So now let's uh, go into the detail of each, in each of the components of the spoken language understanding pipeline, starting with the automatic speech recognition. Now, one of the biggest challenges in speech recognition, and certainly with a product like Amazon Echo, is the, the, what you call the far field speech challenge, which is that the speech is degraded due to phenomena such as reverberation, the sound bouncing off the walls in a room, or ambient noise or background speech. And uh, on top of that, you have the standard challenges of speech recognition, which is large vocabulary, uh, high perplexity domains. Uh, also, it's difficult sometimes to predict spoken forms uh, for catalog entries and their associated pronunciations, especially with artist names. Artists tend to be creative about how they represent the names in written form. And then you also have uh, acoustic confusions uh, between you know, homophones. Uh, so we saw an example you know, towards sun days versus the, the day of the week. Now, uh, a product like Echo mitigates the, the uh, far field uh, reverberation and ambient noise by uh, using uh, the microphone that it has, the microphone array that it has at the top plate. It has actually seven microphones, six around the circumference and one in the center. And with, us, with such a microphone array, it can apply a technique called beamforming to create six listening beams, as we show in the figure here. And uh, each listening beam enhances the signal that arrives from that direction while suppressing any signals that come from other directions. So in this example, we show the user speaking to the device from direction one, and there is also a, a, a fan generating noise from direction six. And I'm going to play a few audio samples from uh, the different uh, beams to see you know, what is the effect that, that, uh, that's happening through the beamforming. First, let's play the audio from the center channel, the center microphone, without any beamforming. Play rock. Play the Rolling Stones. Play Radiohead. Could you play better off alone? So now you heard that there is a mixture of the, the two signals, the speech from the user and the uh, uh, noise from the fan. Now, if we uh, show the, um, the beam in the direction number six, which is pointing to the fan, you're going to listen, you know, the, the noise from the fan more pronounced and the speech more suppressed. Play, uh, play the Rolling Stones. Play Radiohead. Could you play better off alone? Now, if we play the, the, the audio that's coming from beam one, you will see that the, that the reverse effect is happening. The speech is enhanced and the noise is suppressed. Play rock. Play the Rolling Stones. Play Radiohead. Could you play better off alone? And then we have to, the additional problem is which beam to select. And obviously, we want to select the beam that points in the direction of the user. And we do that with a combination of signal to noise ratio and speech activity detection. Now, another problem that uh, we have to deal with uh, in a device like Echo is that uh, usually a device is playing uh, audio itself, right? It can play music that you requested before, or it can have a response that is played through the text-to-speech module. 
And what happens is that each of these beams is now picking up this signal, and that's interfering with its ability to listen uh, to the user. And so we have this technique called acoustic error cancellation, which uses information about the reference playback signal to subtract it from each of the beams before doing the beam selection. And here I'll show you two examples. One is before the acoustic echo cancellation, where two users are trying to wake up the device by uh, saying the word Alexa, and then after echo cancellation. So let's hear first uh, without echo cancellation. Alexa. So you can imagine, in this case, it's very difficult for, for Alexa to have actually you know, hear its name, right, when the user is calling. Now, after echo cancellation, because we know what uh, signal is playing, we can suppress it and therefore enhance the speech from the direction of the user. Alexa. 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 And so this has a very pronounced effect and is very effective, uh, especially in detecting the wake word uh, during a playback. Okay, so once we apply these techniques on the device, we send the enhanced audio to the cloud to carry out the speech recognition. And so the first step that we do in that process is feature extraction. Uh, this consists of having a sliding window over the audio waveform, extracting a feature vector representation of the signal every 10 milliseconds. And that feature vector basically encodes information about the uh, uh, energy level in, each, uh, in different frequency bands. Uh, then we, fed that into, we feed that into an acoustic model, which is in this case a deep uh, neural network, to map the feature vectors to phonetic probabilities. And then this go into the decoding or inference stage, where along with the language model and uh, pronunciation lexicon, we try to find what is the best sequence of words that corresponds to that uh, speech signal. And so we have an example here where the user said increase to 70 degrees. You see the tokens coming out of the recognition. And then optionally, we have a post-processing step to format that into a written form to display to the user on a screen, let's say on, on an Echo Show or a Fire TV. Now, we mentioned the language model as one of the components in that uh, decoding step. Uh, in the language model consists of uh, what we call n-gram probabilities, basically the probability of a word following a sequence of preceding words. And in convers conversational free forms, this is, uh, pr these probabilities are very uh, spread out. Basically, uh, it's not easy to predict what word comes next given a sequence of words. And uh, in language modeling terms, this is often characterized as having a high perplexity. It is also addressing the branching factor during the search for finding the best word sequence. Basically, a high perplexity means higher branching factor, more ambiguity, and therefore the search is more difficult. So in order to improve that, what we, effectively what we have to do is sharpen the probabilities of these n-grams. And we can do that by the easiest way is to increase the language model capacity, meaning you need to have more n-grams and also bigger n-grams, more context. Um, now, this increases the language model size, unfortunately. It can have a, a negative effect on latency. So what we did is we, we developed a new representation for the language models and a new decoder that allows us to actually use uh, language models as big as 10 times more than what we used to have before without any impact on latency. And this capability was very important uh, for the Alexa Prize program, as we will see later, enabling in, uh, improvements in speech recognition accuracy. The other component that we referenced in the diagram was the uh, uh, acoustic model. And here we use, as I mentioned earlier, a deep neural network that takes the frame level speech features and is trying to predict the phonetic probabilities. Uh, this network is trained on data from lots of speakers, so it can handle different accents and different speaking styles. However, we found that we can do even better if we adapt this network or personalize it to each speaker on the fly. And we can do that by estimating a, a speaker level feature vector that uh, characterizes the, the voice of the speaker in, in course, course terms, similar to the vector that we use for doing speaker identification. And we feed that as a side information to the deep neural network, and that effectively results in adapting the network to the speaker. And we can update these estimates of the uh, speaker features with more utterances as the speakers interact with the device. 
So that led to about 5 to 7% relative reduction in word error rate compared to just using the speaker independent model. Now, another important aspect of speech recognition is the knowing when to stop listening, uh, right? As we call the speech endpointing. And on a device like Echo, this is uh, very much needed because there is no button. So the user doesn't press a button to indicate when they stop speaking. So you have to detect that automatically. A naive way to do this is to have an energy uh, level detector. And uh, when there is a pause, the energy naturally drops down and you can stop at long pauses. But consider this example where the user might say, play music by Sting. So there is a pause before saying the artist's name. Uh, a simple detector like uh, energy-based is going to more likely uh, break at the first pause, interrupting the user. So this is a form of early endpointing, which is an error. So what we've done to mitigate this is to have, we have a acoustic and linguistic uh, information that we are combining. So in this case, the two pauses are very similar from an acoustic perspective, but they are very different from a linguistic perspective. Uh, the second pause is much more likely to be at the end of a sentence than the first one. And so that, that helps mitigate these problems. Now, early endpointing is one problem. Another is late endpointing. And this is best illustrated with an example where you can have the user saying, Alexa, play music, and then somebody else in the background saying something else. And now, you know, the, the system might be confused and think that this second speaker is actually directing the request to the device and keeping the audio stream open for too long. That increases the latency of responding to the first user, and it also introduces opportunity for word insertion errors. So uh, what we want to do effectively is to be able to listen to the first user who spoke the wake word and ignore the second user, right? So what we can do that is through a technique we call anchored speech detection. What we do basically is we use the wake word to create a model of the anchor speaker, in this case, the person who spoke the wake word, using a recurrent neural network or encoder to create a fixed length representation of this anchored speech. And then we feed that as side information to the decoder network, which frame by frame is trying to predict whether this speech is coming from the anchor speaker or not. And uh, this basically helps quite a bit with this problem. Uh, it reduces uh, the frame classification error rate by 19%, and it also leads to 9% relative reduction in word error rate compared to just using a, a baseline approach. Okay, so that was speech recognition. Let's go now to the next component, which is natural language understanding. So here, the, the goal is to understand the spoken intent and the uh, uh, slots that may be associated with it. And we talked about this in the beginning with, with the example. Now, the challenges here are that uh, you have cross-domain intent recognition errors. Uh, two very different uh, requests may share the same words. So play remind me or remind me to go to the play refer to very different intents. If you just use a bag of words or presentations, you're not going to be able to distinguish them from each other. The word order is very important. The other is that you challenge is that you have to be robust to ASR errors. Uh, you also have to be um, to accommodate user correction in context. So in this case, if the user wants to uh, rephrase the request uh, without having to speak it again, they can just say, no, the Rolling Stones, meaning that they want the system to understand that they want to just change the, uh, uh, the artist's name and they're not stating a, a new intent. Also, the system has to be able to reject out-of-domain utterances. It basically has to know uh, what are the things that it cannot support. And we have to do all of these things with high precision and recall because uh, typically there is no screen connected um, uh, for the user to select between a set of uh, options. So if you look at the intent classification problem, even for a very simple request such as uh, getting information about the weather, there are many different ways that user can access this information, right? And we have a list of examples here. On top of this linguistic variability, there is also uh, spoken language effects. For example, the user might hesitate or might introduce some, some pauses or word restarts. And the system has to be robust to those kinds of uh, effects. Similarly, for the named entity recognition, uh, even for you know, just a, a date type, there is many ways to refer to that. Um, and so the, the model should be able to recognize uh, these word sequences as having the same date type. Uh, related to that is the entity resolution or entity linking. Uh, so this is once you have detected a particular entity type, let's say weather location, city, or, or weather date, 
uh, you have to now take those spoken uh, terms and associate them or link them to a real world entity, which may be an entity value in a catalog. For example, the spoken tokens LA, they will have to map to Los Angeles in order to be able to execute uh, uh, on behalf of the user. Similarly, tomorrow will have to be resolved to an actual date. Okay, so now the, another component we mentioned is text-to-speech synthesis. Uh, this has its own set of challenges, uh, so it has to deal with homographs. Now, this is words that are written identically, but they have different pronunciations, like live and, and live. Uh, and so it, it has to be able to resolve that ambiguity by taking into account the context around the words. Another problem is normalizing the text. Uh, sometimes the text that you pull out from Wikipedia, if you want to speak it back to the user, it, it has abbreviations that need to be expanded, like M, when need minutes or miles, uh, depending on the context. Also, we have to convert the text to phonemes, which is you know, the graphing to phoneme conversion. And uh, for languages with complex mappings, this may be difficult. Uh, English is one example. Uh, the pronunciations may vary also depending on the location of the user. And then you have to deal with foreign words, proper names, uh, and slang. So here we can see uh, how all of these things come together in an example. So let's say that the text is, uh, she has $20 in her pocket. First, we have to do the text normalization to um, convert it to spoken form, expanding the digits into the, the, the spoken form presentation, and the dollar sign as well. Then we have to predict the pronunciations for each of these tokens using the graphing to phoneme conversion. We can see now the sequence of the, of the phonemes. And then based on that, you have to construct the waveform. Um, there is one approach, concatenative synthesis, that is trying to pull acoustic units and stitch them together to create the waveform that sounds natural. And then you have the overall the, the, the speech. She has $20 in her pocket. And uh, of course, uh, developers can also use, besides having the text as shown here, they can use special markup to indicate how this uh, text should be spoken by Alexa to indicate eth emphasis, for example, by changing the prosody or adding pauses and stress. Finally, the other component we mentioned in the beginning is the dialogue manager. And so this uh, sits between the natural language understanding and the application layer. Uh, it is uh, basically used to uh, you know, create multi-turn interactions with the user in the context of a dialogue. The goal is to understand and satisfy the user's need through a sequence of interactions while minimizing the notion of accumulated frustration. And there is many challenges uh, in, in doing that. First, the user's goal might actually change or evolve during the course of the conversation. Also, the uh, dialogue manager has to understand in context, taking into account user preferences as well. Uh, it may have to coordinate with multiple skills. Uh, for example, if you make a reservation, uh, for a dinner, you might want also to create a, a, a reminder in your calendar. It has to be robust to ASR and NLU errors. Uh, also handle ambiguity and elicit proper clarification with feedback from the user. Uh, the response that it generates they must be natural and engaging. And you have to do all of these things maintaining a balance between eliciting the required information and uh, introducing friction. So a standard approach to doing a dialogue manager in a probabilistic way is the, uh, using uh, the Markov decision process. And that consists of several uh, components. The first is the set of dialogue states. Uh, next is the set of actions from the current state. Then you have pi, which is the dialogue policy, mapping states to actions. Uh, you also need to model the transition probabilities between states. Uh, so basically being able to predict what is the next state given the current state and an action then you have to estimate a reward function from the input that the user is providing in each turn. Uh, that basically is linked to user satisfaction in some way. And then you have this discount factor gamma that is trying to balance short-term versus long-term reward. And then, you know, one, one common approach is to apply reinforcement learning to actually be able to learn from this sequence of interaction. So what happens is that you have the tuples of state, action, and reward. From those, you estimate the expected cumulative uh, reward given the policy. And then over time, you alternate between these two phases of exploration and exploitation. In the exploration phase, you take actions that may be deemed suboptimal, but you're trying to search the space to see if there are better, better policies to leverage. 
And then you have the exploitation phase where you take actions that maximize the expected cumulative reward. And this is basically the, the leading to the optimal policy. OK, so now let's uh, talk about the Alexa Prize competition in more detail, some of the uh, signs that took place uh, in each of these components of the spoken language understanding. So first uh, was the conversational ASR. Uh, the Alexa team created a customized uh, ASR language model uh, to be able to improve the, the aspects that we dis discussed earlier about the perplexity. So this was a larger language model that was also trained with more conversational text and uh, uh, speech transcripts. The university teams, to increase robustness, they used then best output from the speech recognition. On the conversational NLU side, we introduced the conversational intent uh, so that uh, we can connect the customers to the social bots when they wanted to say, Alexa, let's chat. Or Alexa, you know, uh, would you like to have a conversation about Mars mission? Uh, university teams used open source knowledge bases and graphs, for example, EV, Freebase, Wikidata, IMDB. Um, they also did anaphora resolution, sentence completion, named entity extraction, topping clicking, and more. And then we have the dialogue manager. The, that was one key component, of course, in the conversational system. Uh, there, the university teams used a range of approaches, uh, including combination of macro and micro uh, bots. And the micro bots differed in many different ways, in different dimensions. So one dimension of variation was topics. For example, you had micro bots specializing on sports or politics or, or fashion. Uh, another dimension was data. Uh, micro bots trained only on Reddit or, or Twitter or Washington Post uh, corporate. And then uh, intent. So for example, you could have a microbot that was specializing on chit chat and another one on opinion or, or knowledge. Uh, of course, they had to track uh, state uh, through, through the dialogue, uh, leveraging information about the user, extracting sentiment, uh, also personal preferences. Uh, some teams had specialized modules for engagement and customer experience uh, to be able to drive longer dialogues and more engaging conversations. And then well, practically all teams had to have components to detect with uh, profanity and offensive speech and try to mitigate that both offline when processing the large collections of text uh, for their training as well as during runtime, during the actual conversation with the customer. Uh, on the response generation side, uh, there were different approaches that were employed by the university teams. Uh, one approach was to have rule-based uh, templates, uh, so using AI, ML, or ELISA systems. Another approach was to have retrieval, where basically you create offline a, a, a response bank, and then during runtime, uh, you relate the user's uh, utterance to one of these uh, responses in, in, the, in, the, in the bank. Um, and this can be created from Reddit, Twitter, or Washington Post. Uh, the, the matching can be done with similarity based on criteria such as TFIDF or word to vec or sentence embeddings like skip thoughts and entity matching. Another approach for more, um, uh, handling more complex, ambitious, and, and emphatic responses was to use generative models that actually construct the response on the fly. And these are trained uh, using LSTMs or memory networks. Uh, some teams use hierarchical neural networks, attention, and other sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. Uh, there were also combinations of these things we call hybrid uh, systems. Uh, so basically, you have uh, an assemble of retrieval and generative models. Perhaps sometimes the retrieval models are executed first, generating candidate responses, which are then ranked using a generative model. Or you have retrieval uh, models, but you fall back to a generative model if the confidence of the retrieval system is, is uh, low. And there were also multi-bot strategies. So different techniques for different microbots. For example, uh, using rules and templates for question answering or uh, generative uh, models for chit chat. Now, when you have microbots that provide uh, different responses, uh, you have the problem of you know, how to select between them. And uh, so some, tech, some teams uh, developed uh, ranking modules uh, to be able to cope with that problem. Um, uh, features to, that were used to train the ranker included sentiment, uh, utterance response, coherence, relevance, uh, user feedback, engram, and topical match. And the best strategy was to continually update the ranker based on user feedback and rating using, using reinforcement learning. 
Now, speaking of feedback, uh, the, the university teams had access to uh, different forms. So first, you know, there was the rating that was provided by the actual customer that they were interacting with. And this was in the, a number in the range of one to five. Uh, then there was feedback that was provided by the Alexa Prize team itself uh, through some data analytics that was performed on the conversations that were carried out between the customers and the social bots. And that uh, consisted of different dimensions. So one was the topic conversational quality, other was response error rate, uh, coherence, engagement, and customer experience gaps. For example, uh, looking at cases where uh, the dialogue and navigation was not optimal or where the intent recognition was, was uh, not correct. And then the Alexa Price team also shared utterance response pairs uh, that were where the, the social bots had trouble. And these were used, all of these, uh, including the, the customer feedback, were used by the social bots to uh, provide better experiences, basically update their uh, components and, and do uh, better in the dialogue. Some of the key learnings from analyzing the feedback uh, from the users. Uh, now, besides the rating, the users also had an opportunity to provide uh, open-ended feedback to the social bots they were interacting with. And from those, we could uh, see that basically they were generally interested in conversing with social bots. They uh, appreciated uh, when the social bots acknowledged the request, even if they couldn't support it. Uh, so basically knowing what they didn't know, this was a, a preferred thing for, for the user's perspective. Uh, users did not like uh, switching topics abruptly during the, the dialogue. And uh, some users were very engaged with uh, some of the games that uh, uh, social bots could employ. I know at least my daughter was uh, very you know, engaged with uh, uh, popularity, you know, personality quiz. Uh, now, of course, this, uh, this is a competition, so we had to come up with evaluation metrics to be able to uh, evaluate the social bots that were participating. And so one dimension of evaluation was uh, coherence. So basically taking, taking a look at the turn level response quality, and uh, this was done uh, through data annotation. Another view was engagement. Uh, this is demonstrated by the user ratings, number of turns, the duration of the conversation. Uh, domain coverage was another dimension, uh, basically trying to assess entropy across uh, the top five competing domains, entertainment, politics, sports, fashion, and technology. Topical diversity was another view, um, uh, trying to analyze the topic frequency, vocabulary, and variation in topics across the conversations for each of the social bots. Conversational depth, which is the ability to have multi-turn conversations about the topic before switching to another topic. And then for the final list, in order to determine what were the three top uh, social bots to go into the finals, uh, we selected the top two based on the customer ratings, and the third one was selected based on uh, the above metrics, a large pool of eternal evaluators and science paper reviews. So the teams had to submit papers describing the technology, and this was part of the criteria that uh, led to the uh, final list determination. So now let's look uh, at the results. Uh, so this graph shows the daily average uh, rating for the social bots. So we have two lines here. The top line corresponds to the three finalists. And, and the one at the bottom is for across all the social bots. Um, and these are basically, as we said earlier, from uh, ratings in the range of one to five. And as we can see over the period of time, the ratings improved for the finalists uh, by 24% relative. Um, now we can see here there are three distinct phases. First is the, uh, the, the launch of the program on May 8th. Uh, then we have the semifinal period. And then we have the post semifinal periods. And we can see that there is a marked difference in the performance, certainly during the semifinal period, which is from the end of June to end of August, uh, for the uh, three finalists. And this is where we also got a lot of internal uh, 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 users to interact with the social bots to provide more opportunities for learning for, uh, for the uh, university teams. And we can see that there were actually uh, several occasions where the uh, ratings exceeded 3.5 during that period. Uh, another interesting aspect uh, is that we had these echo newsletters that we were sending periodically uh, to all the customers all Alexa customers, where we announced the availability of the 
uh, Lex Price social bots, and, uh, and we can see that there are some drops in the ratings with every of these new newsletters. And that typically indicates that there were new users that were uh, starting to interact with the social bots. And because they didn't know what to expect, you could see this drop. Uh, this is common, but then as you can see, it ramps up over time. Another aspect that led to this improvement uh, in ratings is also what the Alexa uh, Prize team did to improve the conversational language model that we discussed earlier. Uh, so through you know, uh, the larger language modeling and also training on more matched text, on conversational text, uh, we saw a 41% reduction in ASR-induced failures. Uh, and uh, that was very helpful. Now, a few other key metrics to see for the entire competition. First, there is uh, average rating, response error rate, average number of turns, and median di dialogue duration. And we can see that the finalist social bots did better than you know, compared to all social bots on, on all of each of these dimensions. And then this uh, difference is more pronounced in the semifinals, as we mentioned earlier, uh, between the two categories. OK, so we reached the last slide. So here we have some conclusions and next step. Uh, so let's start with the conclusions. So good progress this year, but uh, the problem is far from solved. Uh, as Ashwin mentioned uh, earlier today, we are intending to continue this competition uh, next year to, to uh, uh, have the university teams leverage the data that they obtained through this phase and, and uh, improve the technology further. Uh, the customer ratings uh, depend on many factors in addition to ASR and response correctness. Obviously, engagement is a very complex term. Uh, it's, it's not just that you, you have a very good technology. You have to be able to have the right prompts and uh, engage in conversations. Um, of course, high quality relevant data is critical in developing a good dialogue system. And we hope that with the collection of these uh, many hours, 40,000 hours, over a million of interactions, now we have bigger opportunities for, for growth and development in this space. And uh, the teams now, because this was the first year, they spend a lot of time in actually engineering, right? The components, connecting them together, making sure that the services were up and running. Um, we expect that uh, next year, they will focus more on actually developing the core technology, and this uh, would lead to further improvements. So in terms of next steps, uh, so we will share this year's learnings with the research community through published proceedings. I think these are already up in the alexaprice.com website. So I would encourage you to go there and, and see what the university teams did. Also, we need to continue improving the conversational ASR. Uh, this is a key component in the dialogue. Uh, this needs to be as accurate as possible. And uh, to provide next year's Alexa Prize contestants with additional engineering support and tools. And so, this is the end of the talk. Uh, I would like also to ask you, in this case, you know, what is the next skill that you would like to develop? Uh, how will you design your interaction model uh, to create this engaging conversational experiences with the customers? And I would like to encourage you to take advantage of the many sessions and the tutorials this week, and we'll do the best to support you and answer your questions. Thank you.